Danny, one of the highlights of my life is to come to Mealdale and be a part of this great conference and to stand here and uh, to be able to preach to you the word of life. I lived in Louisiana for a while and uh, realized why we moved back to Tennessee. The wind was so strong here that my hair kept getting in my eyes. And, um, and that happened yesterday. Boy, I like to killed me yesterday. But uh, hey, open your Bible, if you would, to 2 Timothy. I know we've heard a dynamic message from the book of 2 Timothy already this morning. Uh, Brother Bill stepped all around my sermon, but he never stepped on it. And so I thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for His Word that no matter how many times we read a verse, no matter how many times we hear a message about something, there's always something fresh that the Lord wants to give us. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 16, down through verse number 5, but I want to take you through uh, this great chapter of the Bible. Uh, Beginning in verse number 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible is profitable. It's good for uh, teaching us what's right. It's good for teaching us what's not right. That's reproof. It's good for teaching us how to get right. That's correction. It's good for teaching us how to stay right. That's training or instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore, Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Father, today, would you minister to our hearts, encourage us, in the things of the Lord. And God, may that man, that woman that's here, that's going through the difficulties of life, that's dealing with struggles and troubles, Lord, may you speak to our heart today in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, when I was a little boy, uh, we learned a song in Bible school that went something like this. The B-I-B-L-E Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. You remember that song? Sing sing it with me. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. You know, this Bible that you hold in your hand is an interesting book. Now, we don't worship the Bible. We worship the author of the Bible. We worship the one who wrote the Bible, but the Bible is an extraordinary book. It's an amazing book. It's a wonderful uh, thing that teaches us about God Himself. In fact, if we were to go through the Bible and read what the Bible says about itself, we would find some very interesting truths. The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 89, Forever, O Lord, Your Word is settled in heaven. The Bible says in Isaiah 40 in verse number 8, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Psalm 119 and 103, How sweet are thy words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey, to my mouth. And I love what the Bible says about itself in Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We could read all day long about what the Bible says about itself. In fact, I I think it'd be a very interesting study sometime just to take the Bible and see what the Bible says 
about itself. The Bible tells us here in verse number 16 of chapter 3 that the Bible helps us. It teaches us. It, it is the authoritative word of God. It is that God breathed word. Listen, man didn't write the Bible. God wrote the Bible. It came from the heart of God. Men were moved along by the Holy Spirit to write what God told them to write. And so from Genesis to Revelation, this book that I hold in my hand, the Bible that is in your hand, is the Word of God. Thank God for the Bible. And we can be equipped through the Bible for every task that God calls us to do. Everything that God would lead us to do, He gives us the equipment that we need in the Bible. Every challenge, every difficulty, everything that we would ever go through, the Bible is our source and our authority. That's why, Pastor, you must preach the Word. Your people and my people need to be equipped to go through the seasons of life, to deal with the struggles of life. We need to understand and we need to preach the Bible. And so I want to answer a question this morning or this afternoon. What can you do with that Bible in your hand? That's the title of the message. What can you do with that Bible in your hand? And I believe in chapters 3 and 4, that Paul answers that question for us in four ways. Now I know that, that there are more than four things that you can do with the Bible, but I'm going to stay true to this text and, and uh, see what, how Paul answers this question. What can you do with that Bible in your hand? The first thing that I notice here is that with the Bible in your hand, you can find hope in the days of prominent depravity. With the Bible in your hand, you can find hope in the days of prominent depravity. Go back to chapter 3 and look at verse number 1. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, dangerous, dark, destructive days shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We are living in those days. It is a catalog of corruption that is in our society. Men love themselves more than they love anybody else. They are constantly men. You watch the television, you read the newspaper, and you find out this is true, that men and women around this globe that don't know Jesus think more about themselves than they do anybody else. The Bible says here that in the last days they'll be covetous. They'll want what other people want more than what they have. You've heard the stories of teenagers killing other teenagers for a pair of shoes. You've heard the stories of how the, the, the people will just do whatever. If you have something that I want, I will stop at nothing to get it for myself. It doesn't matter if I hurt you in the process. I want it. I deserve it because I love myself more than I love you. The Bible says that in the last days men will be boasters. They'll not only love themselves and want what you have, but, but uh, they will uh, tell you how wonderful they are with their words. They'll be proud. They'll have an attitude of arrogance. We live in those days. Blasphemers. They'll curse God at the drop of a hat. Disobedient to parents. Thank for the parents that still take the belt off and have a, have a belt to behind lecture, a come to Jesus meeting with their boys and their girls. Thank God, I wish to God we'd get back to those days. when. Listen, my mama and my daddy, my mama used to tell me when I was growing up, she said, son, you've been bad. Go out there and find me something to beat you with. 
Now, I went back to my room one time, brought back the biggest balloon I could find, and uh, thank the Lord for that. Listen, I used to go out to my backyard and get my own switch off the tree and give it to my mama to wear my... I sat in church for days and weeks and years with a switch hanging out of my mama's purse, and if I acted up, my mama switched my leg. She didn't worry about taking me home. She didn't worry about taking me out. She did it right there. We need to get back to those days. The Bible says in the last days they'll be unthankful and unholy and without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. It means they'll, be, they'll have no self-control. They'll be fierce, despisers of those that are good. <laughs> Traitors, they'll betray their friends. In these days in which we live, friendship don't mean anything to anybody. Heady. They'll be intoxicated with conceit. They'll be proud. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sad to say, that's people in the church too. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. They'll have that external form that we've heard so much about already this week, that Brother Larry so, so eloquently put this morning, that, uh, that, that, that they will not understand the power of genuine worship. They'll not understand what it means to worship a holy God. They'll not understand what it means to come into the presence of God. They'll be satisfied with coming for an hour and sitting for... Listen, it's not even an hour anymore. It's 45 minutes now. And they'll come and they'll say, now we're going to give you our 45 minutes to an hour, but, but bless God, don't go over it. They'll have a power, the form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof. We are living today with this result in our society. You pick up the newspaper and you think you're, you, you might read the USA Today, but you think you're reading right here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The progressive deterioration of spiritual life in the society in which we live. People reject God and fall in love with themselves. That leads to a moral collapse where people do what they want to do, which leads to a total breakdown of society. And if we're not there already, we're headed there very fast to a total breakdown of our society. Anything goes. There are no rules. People say there are no moral absolutes. But here's what I want to tell us this, morning, this afternoon. Those things should never surprise the child of God. Because as I go back to verse number 1, I see where Paul says, in the last days. In the last days, perilous times, difficult times, depraved times, dark times, times, destructive times, in the last days. Those are characteristics, friends, of the last days. Not the early days, not the better days. Those are characteristics of the last days. And listen, it may be difficult and it may be dark and it may be destructive and it may be dangerous today to live as a Christian. But hold on, because the Bible that is in your hand and the Bible that is in my hand says that one day the eastern sky will split, one day the trumpet of God will sound, one day the voice of the archangel will shout, and the Lord Himself shall descend and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds for centuries upon centuries upon centuries the church has had one hope the church has held on to one promise behold do not be afraid do not let your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you behold I go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also <laughs> we're living in the last days and the Bible that is in your hand says that you can find hope in the days of prominent 
depravity. See, the Bible says in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. The Bible in your hand says our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible that is in your hand in Titus 2.13 says that we are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I heard about a man one time that he was uh, wanted a pet, but he didn't want anything that he had to take care of. He didn't want anything he had to feed all the time. He wanted a simple, maintenance-free pet. So he went to the pet store, and the man said, I've got just what you need in the back. He went to the back of the store and brought out a little box. He said to the man, this is a centipede. And all you have to do is put a little lettuce, a little grass, in the, in the box every now and then. The centipede will eat, and he'll be fine. The only thing you have to do is every now and then, this centipede likes to take a walk. Man thought, well, that'd be pretty easy. So he took the box home, set the centipede on the table. A few days went by, he'd put some grass in there. A few days went by, and he decided, I'm going to take the centipede for a walk. And so he looked in the box, and he said, Centipede, we're going to go for a walk. The centipede didn't do anything. Just sat there. So he was a little bit miffed by that, and so he walked away. A few minutes later, he came back. He said to the centipede, he said, I I want us to go for a walk. Nothing happened. And so he thought, well, I don't understand it. The the man said he liked to go for walks, and so I thought he might be a little more excited than that, and so he didn't do anything. A few hours went by. He went back to the box, and he said to the centipede, I said, I want us to go for a walk. That third time, the centipede lifted his head, looked up outside that box, and he said, I heard you the first time. I was just putting on my shoes. (laughs) Hey, I've got news for you. On January the 16th, 1989, when Jesus Christ came to live inside of my heart, I put on my shoes. And listen, I'm listening for the sound of the trumpet. I am looking now for someone to split the eastern sky. I'm not looking anymore for signs. I'm not listening anymore for something else to happen. I am ready if Jesus Christ should come even today. My shoes are on and I'm ready to go home to be with Jesus. Jesus is coming again. You see, with the Bible that's in your hand, you can find hope in the days of prominent depravity. Secondly, with the Bible that's in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. With the Bible that's in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. In verse number 10, Paul said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, and my patience. What a wonderful resume. What a wonderful truth to leave people behind to say you know my doctrine you know what I taught you know how I've lived my life you know my manner my purpose my faith you know all about me but verse number 11 says something totally different verse number 11 he said you know about my persecutions and the afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured but out of out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. With the Bible that's in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. When I was pastoring in another part of the state of Tennessee, I was convinced that preaching the Word of God was the only way to build a church. And by the way, I'm still convinced that preaching the Word of God is the only way to build a church. And I would stand up on Sunday morning and I would preach 
with power in all of my heart. I would preach on Sunday night and I would preach on Wednesday night and it got to be in that church that people began to rebel against the Word of God. They hated the Bible. And every Sunday when I would get up to preach, there was a group of ten people who stood up, waited for the music to end. And when I got up to preach and walked to the pulpit, they got up from all over the auditorium and walked out the back door. And those days, I would go home. And I was like, Brother Herb, God, would you please get me out of here? God, would you please open the door for me to go somewhere else? And over and over and over, I walked out one Sunday morning to get a drink of water, got choked in the service, and there was a committee meeting happening in the middle of the hallway during the middle of the Sunday morning church service. Some of you pastors, you've been there. Some of you are there now. But I want you to know that with the Bible that's in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. See, Jesus never promised me that it would be easy. He never promised me that there would not be any heartache, there would not be any hardship, there wouldn't be any trouble. But He did promise me that His Word would comfort me. His Word would lead me. God gave me this Word in Ezekiel chapter 2. And He said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when He spake unto me and set me upon my feet. And I heard Him that spake unto me. And He said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For their impudent children and stiff-hearted, I do send thee unto them, And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious people, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. Man, I want to tell you something today, you pastors. You're battling hell by the acre. You wonder, what am I doing here? God, would you please move me? God, would you please get me out of here? You stand up and you stand on the Word of God and you preach in the power of the Spirit of God. Thus saith the Lord. And whether they listen to you or whether they don't listen to you, that's none of your business. That's not your calling. You don't have to worry about whether they listen or whether they don't listen. You don't have to worry about whether they obey or whether they don't obey. You preach the Word in the power of the Spirit and they will know that a prophet has been among them. You see, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty with that Bible that's in your hand. But I want to tell you something. We don't just endure persecution. By the way, I believe that we're coming desperately close in America to a, a, a time when we'll be persecuted for our faith if Jesus doesn't come back. And the President of the United States thinks that he is, uh, he, he's all by himself and he can do whatever he wants to do. And he can, he can just, uh, uh, and I believe, listen, I believe we have to pray for the President. God's Word commands us to pray for the leaders that are over us. But I believe that he thinks, he, I believe he's, he's marked by what marks in, in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2 in, verse, in the verses following. He's a proud man, an arrogant man, a conceited man, high-minded and haughty. But here's what I know. While he thinks that he's doing what he wants to do, my Bible says, and the Bible that's in your hand says, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wants it to go. The Bible says in Job 5, 7, man is born of trouble, as sure as sparks fly upward. And while I do believe that we are headed for persecution and affliction because of our faith, I believe there's another kind of suffering. See, I believe that God's people suffer. I believe that God's people go through stuff just like Job. I mean, you remember Job. Job had everything. He had it all. Money, family, 
houses, land, didn't matter. Job had it all. And one by one, messengers came and said, Job, you're not going to believe this, but all your family's gone. Job, you're not going to believe it, but all your land and all your houses have been destroyed. All of your livestock is gone. Your wealth is gone. Job, you've got nothing left. Job might have said, well, I still have my wife. But she said, curse God and die. Man is born of trouble, as sure as the sparks fly upward. I'm encouraged by Job's story, because that wasn't the end for Job. For about 40 chapters, Job cried and mourned and thought and talked and wondered what in the world's going on, why is this happening? The three best friends in his life came to encourage him with great news. To say, Job, if you hadn't sinned, you wouldn't be dealing with this right now. And Job mourned and sat in sackcloth and ashes. And finally, he said, God, just do whatever you want to do. And you know the end of the story. The Bible says that the latter days of Job were better than the beginning. And God gave him more in the last days than he had at the first. See, what I want to tell you this, morning, this afternoon is that with the Bible that's in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. And there's some people today that will tell you that if you're a child of God, you won't ever have to go through suffering. They'll tell you that suffering is of the devil, and if you believe God and have enough faith, that you're never going to have to deal with any kind of hardship. I wonder if that's why Paul said endure hardship. We're going to suffer. God loves us too much not to allow some suffering into our life. See, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What do you say to a mother who's watching her son slumped over a steering wheel in a car who's just hit a tree. She's one of the first ones to find him on the scene of that accident. What do you say to that mother who sits in the back seat of that car because she can't get in the front seat because the door is smashed in so much that it won't open? What do you say to that mother as she holds her son's neck and encourages him, breathe, son, breathe, son, breathe, son? I don't have anything to say. November 18th, when it happened to me and my wife, I didn't have anything to say. But thanks be to God that I didn't have to come up with anything. You see, the Bible that's in your hand, the Bible that's in my hand, says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. By the way, my son preached a couple of weeks ago, the doctors told us that after he was airlifted to Memphis to the Med, he'd probably never wake up, and if he did, he probably would never be able to preach, never be able to speak, never be able to talk, probably never be able to communicate again. He's preached about four times since that accident, and God is moving upon his life. What do you say to that someone who is fighting hell by the acre, torn by disease and Riddled with destruction. What do you say to that mother, that father who has wayward children? Listen, I don't have anything to say, and you don't have anything to say, but the Bible that is in your hand says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. The Bible that is in your hand 
The, the Lord Jesus Himself said, Peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give unto you, but my peace I give unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What do you say to that family that is overwhelmed with financial problems? What do you say to that family who it seems like the weight of the world is crumbling in? On top of them. What do you say to that father who is working job after job, hour after hour, and can't get his head above the water? I don't have anything to say to them. And you don't have anything to say to them. But the Bible that is in your hand says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. What do you say to that husband whose wife said, I'm through, I want a divorce? What do you say to that wife whose husband walks out? I don't have anything to say. But the Bible that is in your hand, in my hand, says I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. What do you say to that little boy and that little girl whose daddy comes home from work every afternoon and beats that child to a living pulp? What do you say to that little boy and that little girl who runs and hides behind the doors of their home because they're scared to death of what's going to happen when daddy gets drunk again? I don't have anything to say. But the Bible in your hand says, Though my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord shall lift me up. What do you say to that precious grandfather who's buried his third child? What do you say to the little mama and the little daddy whose baby is lying there in that casket in the funeral home? What do you say to that husband or that wife who has put their loved one there, watched their loved one slip away from cancer or heart disease, whatever else it may be? What do you say? I wished I had something to say. And I don't. But the Bible that's in your hand says death is not the end. See, the Bible in my hand says that He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer be any death. And there will no longer be any mourning. There will no longer be any crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. <laughs> See, with the Bible in your hand, you can find hope in the days of prominent depravity. You can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. Thirdly, you can find help in the days of permeating deception. You can find help in the days of permeating deception. Look, look what he said in verse number 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and has been assured of knowing from whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, here it is, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We live in a world of dark deception. We are living in days when men are deceiving and being deceived, when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, there are people out there today that says, you don't have to worry about it. If God wants you to be saved, God's going to save you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about anything. If you're going to be in heaven, God has already settled that from way back yonder, and you don't have to worry about it. 
My Bible says that as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. I believe God's sovereign. I believe God initiates salvation. I believe it's all of grace. It's all of God. But I believe God gives us a choice. And we can say yes or we can say no. But I don't believe that's the greatest deception when it comes to salvation. You see, I believe that today in the, in the society in which we live, there's a deception going around that says everybody's good. Nobody's bad enough to go to hell. But the Bible that is in my hand and the Bible that you hold in your hand says in Romans 3.10, there is none good, no, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's, there's a deception today that says good works and religion will make you right with God. If you go to church on Sunday and if you give money in the offering, you don't have to tithe, you don't have to give the 10% the Lord demands, you don't, have to, you don't have to obey all that, just give a little bit, throw God a dollar every now and then, and you're going to be okay. Don't kick the dog when you get home from work. Don't beat the children when you get home. Be nice to your wife, help her clean up after supper, and when all is said and done, when you get to heaven, if the good outweighs the bad, then guess what, boy? You're in. My Bible that's in my hand says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He the right to become children of God. The Bible says, as you therefore have received Him, so walk in Him. There's a deception that says, hey, all roads lead to God. You just be sincere about what you believe. You don't worry about what everybody else is teaching. And don't get so narrow-minded that you think yours is the only way. I mean, you don't, you don't need to go there. Don't, don't, listen. Don't exclude anybody. We all want to get along. But might we all want to sing, hold hands and sing Kumbaya around the campfire. Roasting marshmallows and looking pretty. Some people say, well, Jesus, well, He's one way that leads to God. Now, Jesus is a good way, but surely He's not the only way. Many people, many popular preachers today would tell you if you press them, well, well everybody's going to go to heaven. Everybody's going to get there by and by. But the Bible that is in our hands today. Jesus said, I am the way. And I am the truth. The, the Greek le, uh, article there is emphatic. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, I'm the only way. He said, I'm the only truth and I'm the only life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me. Acts 4.12 is still in the Bible. And it says there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this afternoon at Mildale Bible Conference at Mildale Baptist Church in Zachary, Louisiana, the Bible that is in your hand tells you that Jesus is not a good way to get to heaven and Jesus is not the best way to get to heaven. The Bible that is in our hands says that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. The Bible in your hand. Helps you find hope in the days of prominent depravity. With that Bible in your hand, you can find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. With the Bible in your hand, you can find help in the days of permeating deception. Fourthly, with the Bible in your hand, you can find truth in the days of perverted doctrine. 
Would you go with me to verse number 3 of chapter 4? And Paul says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And I want to tell you this afternoon, there's a line of preachers and teachers coming out of our seminaries and our liberal universities in this world in which we live that are standing in line to tickle people's ears. This scripture to me reveals the heart of many of our churches today. People are no longer interested in the truth of the Bible. In fact, if you were to get right down to it, people don't even care what the Bible says. Some people don't even know what the Bible says. I heard about a guy that graduated from seminary. He was hoping to get his first church. Pulpit committee called him and wanted to know if he'd come and interview with them. And he jumped at the opportunity. So he got there, he and his young bride, and they met with that committee. They were gathered there together in the fellowship hall of that church and the chairman began the questioning of the candidate and he said son he said uh, do you know your bible oh yes sir i i know the bible from cover to cover said the young man i've been to seminary another man asked well do you know the stories and the parables oh yes sir i i know all the stories and the lady that's on the committee she said well i tell you what son she said uh, would you tell us one of the parables of jesus she said i i tell you you just tell us the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the young man scooted his chair back and he said something like this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who went down to Jericho by night and fell among stony ground. And the thorns rose up and choked him nearly half to death. And he said, What shall I do? Then he said, I will arise and go to my father's house. And he arose and climbed up into a sycamore tree. And the next day Solomon and his wife Gomorrah came by and they carried him down to the ark for Moses to take care of him. And as he was going through the eastern gate into the ark, he caught his hair in a limb and he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards he hungered and the ravens came and fed him. The next day the three wise men came and carried him down to Nineveh. And when he got down there, he found Delilah sitting on the wall, and he said, Chunk her down, boys, chunk her down. They said, How many times shall we chunk her down? And he said, They said, How many times shall we chunk her down? Unto seven times. And he said, Nay, but seventy times seven. So they chunked her down four hundred and ninety times. Then she burst asunder in their midst. They picked up twelve baskets of her fragments. And they asked him, Lord, In the resurrection, whose wife shall she be? The pulpit committee chairman stood up. He looked at the other committee members and he said, Folks, this man may be young, but he sure does know his Bible. I think we ought to call him to be our pastor. There are books all over the shelf about the Bible. You can go in any bookstore, you can go in any Lifeway in America, you can find all kinds of books about the Bible. But very rarely do you find somebody who is willing to say, Lord, I just want to read the Bible. Lord, would you just give me a word from the Bible? If you haven't heard anything else I've said all day today, I want you to hear this. Probably the most profound thing that's ever come to my heart, to my mind, and out of my mouth. There's been some stuff come out of my mouth. Not all of it's been profound. But this is profound. Two ways that you can get a word from God. You ought to write these down. Two ways to get a word from God. Here they are. Ready? Open the Bible and read the Bible. Open the Bible and read the Bible. And guess what? The Word of God will penetrate your life. If you'll open it and you'll read it with a pure heart before the Lord. See, with the Bible that's in our hand, 
we can find truth in the days of perverted doctrine. I, I, there's some confusion today about our doctrine. I, I'm a Southern Baptist. My granddaddy was a Southern Baptist pastor. I'm a Southern Baptist to the core. I believe in Southern Baptist, but I want to tell you this, this afternoon, I don't stand on Baptist doctrine. See, I, I learned a long time ago that if the Baptists ever decided they wouldn't believe the Bible, then I wasn't going to be a Baptist anymore. You see, I don't stand on Baptist doctrine. I believe that we have to stand on Bible doctrine. And there's some confusion today about that and there's some fundamental truths of the Bible that we must fight for. There's some fundamental truths that we must believe. You see, the world tells us, listen, don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible. It's outdated, it's irrelevant, it's culturally antique, it doesn't have anything to say to us. Don't worry about the Bible. It was written thousands of years ago. Let it stay back there in that century. My Bible that's in my hand says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus said, the words I give to you, they are spirit and they are life. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. There are some people today that say, well, Jesus couldn't have been born of a virgin. That's absurd to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. He was born like anybody else. He's got brothers and sisters, a mama and a daddy. He wasn't born of a virgin, but my Bible says that a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and you shall name his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. I believe in the deity of Jesus. There's some people today that say Jesus it's just another way. He's just another cog in the wheel. He's just another... Paul, Paul, that's why he wrote the book of Colossians. They believe Jesus was just one of thousands of spirit beings that emanated from, from God Himself. My Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I believe in the deity of Jesus. I believe in the sufficiency of Christ's death and His burial and His resurrection. See, I believe that what Jesus did is good enough for us to be saved. I don't have to do anything else. I believe that Jesus Christ was taken to a hill just outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha and He was nailed there not, not because they took His life but because He willingly laid it down for the sin of the world. And I believe that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. And I believe that on the third day, the stone rolled away and Jesus Christ got up out of that tomb and He walked out of the grave victoriously and powerfully. <laughs> I believe in the work of Christ in heaven. Or some people say that Jesus left us by ourself and he just didn't, He's not worried about us anymore. My Bible says that He's in heaven today praying for you and for me, interceding. He always lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. I believe that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Some people want to talk about the Father and the Son. They won't leave out the Spirit. I, I'm, for one, I'm glad we've got the Spirit. Amen? <laughs> Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. And He will help you and He will guide you. You, you, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'll send you another comforter. And I believe that Jesus is coming again. I believe in the rapture of the church. And I believe in the revelation of Christ on the earth in the second coming. There's some things that we have to hold on to. See, the Bible in your hand will help you find hope in the days of prominent depravity. The Bible in your hand will help you find comfort in the days of promised difficulty. The Bible that is in your hand will help you find help in the days of permeating deception. 
With the Bible in your hand, you will find truth in the days of perverted doctrine. I believe there's one more thing that you can do with the Bible that's in your hand. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us that the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. And I believe that with the sword of the Spirit, you can battle Satan's attacks in your life. Let's go back to a wilderness where Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. The Bible says that the the Spirit led him into that wilderness. And the Bible says that in that wilderness, the devil, the tempter, came and tempted him. Jesus had been fasting and the devil saw that he was hungry and he said, I tell you what, if you're hungry, command that stone to be made bread. What did Jesus do? He took the sword of the Spirit and he said, it is written, thou shalt not, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Stabbed that old devil with the sword of the Spirit. The devil stumbled a little bit and rolled back. But he came right back to Jesus and he said, I'll tell you, Jesus, if you'll throw yourself off this mountain, angels will catch you. They'll not let you fall. And Jesus reached into that sheath and took out the sword of the Spirit. And he said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. A third time, the devil said, Jesus, let's go up here on this high pinnacle. He took him up on the highest pinnacle of all the, the area. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And I believe that he showed him past, present, and future. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to Jesus, If you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you every kingdom that you see. Jesus, not willing to have a crown without a cross, took the sword of the Spirit from its sheath. And he, for the third time, stabbed that old devil... And he said, it is written. Thou shalt worship God. And him alone shalt thou worship. The devil bleeding and bruised from the sword of the Spirit. I know it's not in the text, but it might have happened this way. Looked at Jesus. And he said, I'm going to get you one day. You just wait. And as he made his way out of that wilderness, he said, Jesus, old boy, we're going to have our day. And I believe one more time, Jesus, he might have taken the sword of the Spirit and he might have said to that old devil, Devil, bring it on, old boy, because it is written, you will bruise my heel. But I'm going to crush your head. I'll see you at Calvary. Don't you ever forget, it is written. And in your life, and in my life, we have the sword of the Spirit. Live it. Read it. Memorize it and apply it and obey it. And you'll be blessed with the Bible that's in your hand. We've answered the question, what can you do with the Bible in your hand? One more question. One more question. What will you do with the Bible in your hand?